Hello, I'm Tracy Pegram and I am an ordinand, which is otherwise known as a trainee vicar. And at the moment, I'm in the second year of a three year training course at St Melitis College. And part of my training is to go out and experience other churches in other places. So whilst I'm usually based in Kettering, I've got a four week placement here in the benefice of um, Broughton, Cransley and Morsley. And it's been really great to meet with some of you and to worship with you and to hear about what you're doing in your churches. And I'm especially thankful to Nikki for giving me the opportunity to share a reflection with you on this one of this Sunday's readings from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Our readings over the next few weeks dip in and out of this letter. So I encourage you to take some time if you can to make a cup of tea and sit and read through the whole letter. It probably takes about half an hour or so, but it's well worth doing. Now, last week we heard Nikki talk about Paul, who, after an encounter with Jesus, turned from being Saul, the persecutor of the church, to being Paul, an encourager of the early church. Paul had been to Ephesus, which was a vibrant city, a melting pot of cultures and beliefs, filled with people from all sorts of backgrounds, and he spent time there establishing a church. After some time, he left his Christian friends to continue their work building the church in Ephesus, and Paul continued on his travels. And when he returned some time later, he found that the new church had strayed into some worrying understandings, particularly around baptism and the Holy Spirit. So Paul stayed to set them right. And you can read more about this in Acts chapters 18 to 20. Again, Paul went travelling and eventually ended up being imprisoned in Rome on account of his faith. And while in jail, he writes to the church in Ephesus to continue to encourage them to remain faithful to the teaching they had received. Paul's letter to the Ephesians has two sections. The first reads rather like a sermon on the greatest and widest theme possible, the eternal purpose of God. And the second section gives advice on how the gospel affects everyday life of Christians. And our reading this Sunday is taken from the first section, from chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. In this passage, Paul provides poetic illustration to help us glimpse something of God and God's intention for the reality in which we live. Paul lays out key beliefs of God's purpose, the work of the cross and our place within the enormity of God's plan. And although we think of this letter as being to the church in Ephesus, Paul's words are timeless and universal, and so whilst Paul's time and context may be very different to ours, we can hear him speaking to us today. In trying to express who God is and how God works in our lives through Jesus, Paul's words come tumbling out, good thing upon good thing, more and more and more good things from God, overwhelming us with God's generosity, expressing something of the unending, steadfast love that God has for us. Paul emphasises seven key elements of the eternal purpose of God, or at least that's how many I counted. The first he says that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This blessing is not a one-time event, but a continuous flow of blessing, not of earth earthly things, but of spiritual things. Spiritual things which have great, great value. Paul says, that we are chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before God in love. 
We are and always have been purposed to live in accordance with God's will, to reflect the image of God that is within us from creation. The third point is that we're adopted as children through Christ. Through Christ, all peoples are adopted into the great family of God. Whether Jew or Gentile, it no longer matters. In Jesus, we are all part of God's family. And another point, redemption and forgiveness through Christ's blood. We are forgiven not through the law of the Old Testament, but through the new covenant, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Redemption and forgiveness are ours. Another point that the mystery of God's will is revealed. A plan to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. God's purpose is to unify all of creation in Christ, drawing us all into God's loving presence. Paul says we obtained an inheritance to live for the praise of his glory. This inheritance means that our very lives become instruments of praise to the glory of God. And finally, we're given the word of truth, the gospel or good news of salvation. And on hearing this good news, we are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Each one of these points is enormous. It is enormous that we are adopted as children through Christ. It is enormous that Jesus' death on the cross redeems and forgives us. It is enormous that our very lives can be praise to God's glory. And Paul makes clear these incredible, abundant, generous and glorious gifts come not because we deserve them, not because we're entitled to them, but because God is incredible, abundant, generous and glorious and gives these things to us through love and grace. But this is not a checklist of benefits gained when we decide to follow Jesus. Paul provides this poetic and overwhelming picture of God so that we can focus our hearts and minds when reading the second section, excuse me, second section of his letter where he teaches and instructs. And focusing our hearts and minds on God is what we're called to do day by day to rest in the awesomeness of God. God who doesn't wait around for us to be sorry before he loves us, but a God who, before the foundation of the, our world, knows us, loves us and blesses us in abundance. As I've said, each of these points is enormous. And I invite and encourage you to go and read through the passage again Take some time to think about what these words mean to you and how they help focus your heart and mind on the truth of God, a God who is overwhelmingly, abundantly gracious and generous. Amen. <laughs>